So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Daniel Debeau. I'm the co-CEO of Ripple. Um, I did my MBA and a JD, a JD here at the University of Toronto and at the Rotman School. Uh, I'm a friend of the dean of the school, and I'm happy to have him actually on our board at Ripple. And I suggested that we um, invite Eric Rees to come speak here. And uh, I've been reading Eric's stuff for years. Uh, he's got a fantastic blog and been lucky to sort of know a few people in common. Uh, actually, our, our designer who he introduced us to helped to design that book cover. Um, and I'm really excited that we've got someone of this caliber to come to speak about entrepreneurship here. So thanks for coming. You're all in for a real treat. Uh, please take a moment to turn off all your wireless devices. They interfere with the technology that's installed in this room. Okay, I didn't know that. I'll turn this off here. Um, I was really thrilled when Eric uh, accepted our invitation to fly up here from San Francisco to, to come. Um, and so that we have as much time as possible to hear Eric, I'll keep this really brief. Eric is an entrepreneur and the author of a popular blog called Startup Lessons Learned. He co-founded and served as the CTO of Imview, his third startup. He is a frequent guest speaker at business events, has advised a number of startups, large companies, and venture capital firms on business and product strategy, and he is the entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School. His lean startup methodology has been written about in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, HBR, and many blogs. Uh, and talked about constantly in the valley, I'd say. And last week's Random House uh, published his book, which is fantastic, The Lean Startup, How Today's Entrepreneurs Use Continuous Innovation to Create Radically Successful Businesses. Please join me in welcoming Eric Rees to the Rotman School. Thank you. Wow. There's so many of you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to try an experiment tonight, which as a professional expert is kind of risky, which is to say to hell with the slides, because I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of the stump speech. And I thought, you know, let's have a conversation, because I don't know anything about Toronto. This is my first time here. Very excited to be in a, such a mixed audience of students and faculty, uh, great entrepreneurs like Daniel, and uh, investors They were showing me the lists, really from a diverse set of backgrounds. I said, boy, I have an opportunity to learn something tonight. Uh, if I spend a little bit less time talking and a little bit more time listening. So I want to uh, invite you to interrupt me with questions at any time. Obviously, we'll do Q&A at the end, too. And I thought I would just make some remarks and see how it goes. So it's like walking without a net. You guys OK with that? Thank you for being beta testers. Much appreciated. You'll see that's actually what I'm all about. Uh, let's do some quick ground rules. I know that it interferes with the technology in the room or whatever, but I don't care. So if you wouldn't do me a, if you do me a favor, and take your phones back out again, and all mobiles on, not off. Because if you're not connected to the internet, I don't understand. Is that even living? I don't really understand why you would want to do that. Yeah. Nobody can get on the internet. But there's, there's students can get on the internet for sure. So if you're sitting next to a Rotman student, Rotman students, hold your hand up. They'll help you. Look, look around. Look, here's the thing. You should tweet amongst yourselves, even as I'm talking, because I don't want your undivided attention because we live in the age of continuous partial attention, we should celebrate it. So please, all I ask is if you're gonna tweet while I'm talking, please do that. Just use the Lean Startup hashtag. And the reason we use the Lean Startup hashtag is that there is a global conversation about these ideas happening right now and 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'd like to invite you to be part of it. Because this is not just me and my book tour. It's not just a book that I wrote, published by Crown, and you know, I'm very grateful to, the, to what that's meant for me. The stakes here are a lot higher and a lot more interesting. This is a worldwide movement that is trying to change the way new products are built and launched. And here's the thing. An increasing proportion of our energy as a society is being devoted to the creation of new products. And how's that working out? How do people feel like it's going? Anyone feel like it's going extremely well? That our new product launches are extremely likely to be successful? That customers are always delighted when they get to see a new version of the product? How many people are excited when their smartphone tells them there's a new version of their operating system or a new version of their favorite app? Versus how many people have a sense of dread and say, oh God, what's going to go wrong this time? You know what I'm talking about. Almost everywhere I go, I meet people who work in a company, who work on new projects, and they know deep down in their heart that the work that they do every day doesn't matter to anybody. And I think that is unacceptably an unacceptable waste of people's time and energy. So that's what the stakes are. We think we have an opportunity to do something about that. But in order to do that, we have to take the practice of entrepreneurship and innovation and try to put it on a more rigorous, a more scientific foundation. That's our goal. 
And what is known today about entrepreneurship, I think, is just the tiniest tip of the iceberg, such that when people look back on our time decades from now, they're going to laugh at what we consider to be the management of innovation, the way we laugh at the fact that early 20th century managers didn't even know how to operate a factory or a global supply chain or a multi-division company. Today, we take those things so for granted, we can't imagine that those ideas had to be invented, but they did. So that's what I want to talk about. That's why I invite you to be tweeting as much, much as you like. Plus, if I get boring, you'll have something to do. <laughs> so my background is in tech entrepreneurship. Yeah, I grew up programming computers. So I thought I would be a computer programmer my whole life. One of the happiest days I can remember was when I found out that you could get paid for programming. No, no, no. I was like, I was thrilled. It was like getting paid to play video games. Because I thought programming was something you did simply because it was the most intrinsically enjoyable activity in the world. And as I grew up in my professional career, I kept having the really exciting experience, some of you may be familiar with, of building an amazing new technology that nobody's using. And so it's sitting on a shelf, but it really is technically as excellent as we could make it. And I kept trying to find better and better and better technical solutions to that problem. I was always convinced if I could just find a better product development methodology, a better engineering methodology, a more visionary person to follow, that would solve my problem, and it never did. So for example, uh, I did a dorm room startup back when I was in college during the dot-com bubble. That was my first introduction to entrepreneurship. Was The Social Network a big movie here? Yes, did people see it? Every, who saw The Social Network? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, pretty much everybody. So I had uh, the first half of The Social Network experience. <laughs> Uh, we, got to have, we got to work just as hard as those guys. We built a product just as revolutionary as those guys. In fact, we were building a way for college students to build online profiles for the purpose of sharing with employers for the sake of getting a job. So, so close and yet so far away. We worked just as hard and, and our understanding of what entrepreneurship was, was just what you see in the movies. If you've seen The Social Network, you know the, you know the story really well. It's act one, the plucky protagonists their character strengths and defects that will be interesting later. How they came to be in the right place at the right time, how they came up with their brilliant idea, uh, and most importantly, uh, how they you know, inspired their coworkers and view with their incredible vision, their ability to see the future. Act two, which I also got to experience, is really short. It's what I call the photo montage. It's usually like two minutes long. It's, you know, and the social networks, like they're pounding on some keyboards and then they're writing on those cool markers on the window. Remember that scene? I really like that effect. We used to do that too. That's, that's what it's like when you're in a dorm, obviously. Fancy markers. Uh, and then, you know, you just drink some beer, you get your first customer, and whatever. We move over that part. There's no dialogue in the photo montage. We get right to act three, which is the only thing people really care about, which is how rich are we going to get? How do we divide up the spoils? Who sues who? Et cetera. And like I said, I got to experience acts one and two, but we never never quite got to act three. So what was our understanding of what entrepreneurship is? It's step one, great product, great team. Step two, dot, dot, dot. Step three, cover of magazines. And we really believed that was gonna happen. And when it didn't, I felt really betrayed. I was like, well, how come we work so hard? And in the movies, uh, the plucky protagonists, right when they get down to their last dollar and things seem most grim, is when the customers finally arrive to save the day. You know what I'm talking about? My, my all-time favorite entrepreneurship movie is actually not The Social Network, but Ghostbusters. Who's seen Ghostbusters? So you'll remember that Ghostbusters is not a movie primarily about ghosts, it's mostly about business. You got these guys in a university setting, they come up with this radical new technology, so advanced and visionary that they get kicked out. They have to go start a business, so they mortgage their houses, they build this cool building, they get the car, they do the TV ad, they get the technology working. They basically do everything relating to the technology, they get it working, and then they're, they're literally down to their last dollar when, just like it always happens in the movies, boom, in comes their first customer. Who remembers why the customer came in on that, that very fateful day, luckily? It's because that happens to be the day that Zool is invading Manhattan with his army of ghosts. Isn't it great that Zool had such a good timing? Think about it. If Zool invades Manhattan a year earlier or a year later, no Ghostbusters, no Manhattan. Most of the entrepreneurs I know, incidentally, are busy waiting for Zool. That was me. I figured, well, if things get difficult, we get down to our last dollar, that's when everything will start to work out and our customers will appear. And you can imagine how disappointed I was that it doesn't happen like that in real life. In real life, when you get down to your last dollar, what follows is your zeroth dollar, and that's the end. But we never make movies about those people, so we don't see their stories. So 
that was my introduction, my very rough introduction to entrepreneurship, and that was the fate of most of the companies that I have been involved with. So I know when you're a professional expert, you're not supposed to get up in front of a big audience and say, hi, everybody, uh, most of my startups have failed, and if you follow me, you too can have your startups fail. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but anybody who is telling you the truth about entrepreneurship and not trying to sell you something, will admit that there is incredible failure that precedes every entrepreneurial success, and that was, that was my experience too. And the reason, I believe, is that we are following this three-act play as if it was a business plan rather than a myth designed to sell movies and magazines. Why is it that the photo montage has no dialogue in it? Anyone ever thought about this? The photo montage is over before it even begins, and I believe the reason it has no dialogue is because it's way too boring. Think about what's actually happening in the photo montage. It's things like product prioritization meetings. Does that make a good movie? <laughs> Think about the last product prioritization meeting you were in. Would you like to have cameras there? Would you, know, would you be able to sell tickets and go on for hours and reach no definitive conclusion? That's not very, not very entertaining. Right? Deciding which customers to listen to and which ones to ignore, one of my favorite activities. Arguing with your co-founders about which features absolutely have to be in V1 and which you could live without. Which bugs absolutely have to be fixed and which ones you can live with. Uh, deciding fundamentally whether it's time to pivot to a new strategy or whether we should persevere and keep going. Those are probably the most boring, the most tedious conversations known to man. So they can't make it into the movie, they're too boring. But my discovery in working on this thing called the Lean Startup is that every decision of consequence that impacts the success of startups happens during the photo montage, and it's boring. Okay, right now we're living in this moment, especially in the States, where entrepreneurship is cool all of a sudden, and you know, everyone wants to do it, and it's in the popular media all the time, and listen, it's great for me, because I sell a lot more books that way, because everyone wants to be cool and be an entrepreneur, I'm all for that. But those of you who've been in startups know the truth, which is that entrepreneurship is not cool, and it never should be considered cool, it is hard, boring, tedious, and excruciatingly difficult, plus humiliatingly embarrassing. Because you're constantly failing in public, whereas that's not how it's supposed to be. So we need to make entrepreneurship more boring and less cool. So if that is disappointing to anybody, you know, you feel free to leave, or like I said, be on your device, it's no problem. But that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about two ideas about entrepreneurship that I hope will put you to sleep when you hear what the topics are, ready? Topic number one, management. Topic number two, accounting. What could be more boring than that? So get ready, here we go. What is a startup really? When I first started working on this thing called the Lean Startup, I wanted to have a definition of a startup that we could use as a platform for building this new science of entrepreneurship. And so here's the definition I came up with. A startup is a human institution designed to create something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And the first time I said that out loud, I was a little bit nervous because I added a little postscript. I said, you know, there's something funny about that definition. It doesn't really say anything about how big your company is or what industry you work in or what sector of the economy. It just says you're trying to do organization building under conditions of uncertainty. So in theory, these principles, these lean startup principles should be applicable even to entrepreneurs who work inside big companies or government or nonprofits. And I was nervous because I had no idea what I was talking about. I had no idea if that was true. It was just a consequence of the theory. And yet from that very first time, talking in front of the very first audience, people have come up to me afterwards who you wouldn't normally recognize as an entrepreneur. They don't live in a garage. They don't eat ramen noodles. They have a real office. They have decent benefits. In America, they even have health care. It's very exciting. But they're still entrepreneurs. It's just they happen to work for a big company. They have all the uh, hallmarks of a great entrepreneur. They have the vision to see that their industry has to change. They have the mandate to make a new product that will help their company adapt or die. It's just they happen to work in a regular building. And they used to come up to me and say, OK, I've got all the entrepreneurial prerequisites nailed. If you read a book like The Innovator's Dilemma or The Innovator's Solution by Clay Christensen, one of my heroes, it will tell you all of the prerequisite structures you need to support innovation. An independent P&L statement, the correct divisional authority, the right kinds of people, you know, they'll get, get the right people on the bus and everybody else off. It's like you create this black box around the innovation and then you say, okay, now go to it. And I kept meeting managers who lived inside the black box. They'd be like, okay, I'm in the black box. What the heck do I actually do every day? My team, all of whom have been trained in regular general management, they don't know what to do. 
So can you give me some guidance? And that's what we started to do with Lean Startup, is recognize that these tools are important for anyone who is engaged in what I call entrepreneurial management. The management discipline that deals specifically with situations of high uncertainty. The idea of management is exactly 100 years old this year. So happy birthday management, it is your 100th anniversary. In 1911, a guy named Frederick Winslow Taylor published a book called The Principles of Scientific Management, which is really the first book of its kind to attempt to address the process of work uh, in a scientific way. And if you've ever read a, a book from that time, to us, they're actually hilarious. Uh, the things that Taylor invented are to us so obvious, we absolutely cannot believe they had to be invented. I mean, try to imagine a polemic arguing for the proposition that work should be done as efficiently as possible. Stunning. My favorite, he has a, a long section advocating for what he called the task plus bonus system. And get this, this is crazy. If you have a big project to be done, the right way to go about it is to have a manager decompose it into a series of tasks, hand those tasks off to functional specialists who do that task over and over again, and then here's the best part, I love this. If the person finds a way to do their task better than expected, they should be paid a bonus rather than being penalized. Can you imagine such a crazy system? Think to yourself, who is he arguing against that doesn't think that's the right way work should be done? Well, if you read in, he will then take the counter arguments one by one. And the most prevailing counter argument from the 19th century was if somebody found a way to do work better, what do you know about that person? You know that they're a person of low moral character. Why? Because why weren't they doing it better yesterday? All this time they've been doing it the old way, obviously shirking their duty when they could have been doing it faster. It gets even better. What do we know about their coworkers who are still doing it the old way? Every single one of them is of low moral character. They should all be penalized. Can you imagine that collective punishment for productivity improvements? Imagine that kind of workforce. Those of you who do knowledge work, by the way, don't have to do much imagining. We still manage knowledge workers the exact same way, using a very 19th century theory of work, which is all about finding the great men and just turning them loose to do whatever. We don't really believe in our hearts that innovation can be managed scientifically. I want to try to convince you otherwise. I think if Fred Taylor was alive today, he would laugh at what constitutes our management of innovators and entrepreneurs. So that's my claim. Entrepreneurship is management, just not the general management of Fred Taylor. The unit of progress of that new entrepreneurial management is something I call validated learning. This is really at the crux of what the Lean Startup is all about. We have been trained in the 20th century to focus our energy hyper uh, acutely on trying to get our workplace to run as efficiently as possible. And the definition of that efficiency is making the most high quality stuff as efficiently as possible. So any of us who are trained as engineers, we've been trained to look at a specification document and figure out how do I achieve this specification at minimum effort. Does that sound right? And if, if I'm an engineer who comes to you and says, listen, I found a way to achieve that same spec at 80% you know, of the cost, you're gonna give me a huge promotion because you'll be so excited I save you 20% of the time. Here's my question for this definition of progress. If we as entrepreneurs are building something that nobody wants, why are we proud of having done it on time and on budget? That's fundamentally the problem that we face as entrepreneurs. More often than not, we are simply building the wrong things extremely efficiently. So I have this image of us driving a car off a cliff, but we're bragging about the gas mileage. It's like, we're very efficient, 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 as we go right off the cliff and crash. That's the fundamental problem. Uh, Daniel mentioned that I started a company called Imview. And Imview was a 3D avatar social networking company but we didn't know it at the time. We thought it was a 3D avatar instant messaging company. Because this was 2004 and our aspiration was try to become the next AOL, back when that was still cool. And so we built this 3D avatar instant messaging program. Now, we're in a business school, so let's talk corporate strategy for a second. You're building a new instant messaging program. What do we know strategically about instant messaging? First thing we know is that instant messaging is a network effects business. You guys have been taught that already? Network effects, not along. Network effects means the value of the whole network increases with the square of the number of participants. So if you're the only person in the world with a telephone, not very useful. If everybody has a telephone, super useful. Make sense? 
Everyone in 2004 already had an instant messaging client. They were already locked into some platform. So what else do you know? We know that instant messaging has high switching costs because if you want to bring a new IM network to market, you have to get people to switch away and bring all their friends with them to your new network. Does that make sense? Therefore, in like proper MBAs, we said instant messaging is a business with high barriers to entry. Therefore, we cannot build an instant messaging client. Making sense so far? So we had a strategic brilliance. Check this out. Here was our idea. We would make an instant messaging add-on that would interoperate with all of the existing clients so that you wouldn't have to switch to a new program. Does that make sense? Doesn't that seem like a good idea? And here's the best part. It would cause our product to spread virally through the existing networks like an epidemic. Because in order to use the product, you would click a button to say, go 3D in my conversation, and we would send a link directly to your partner, inviting them to download InView2. And so every time you want to use the product, it's inherently viral. Who thinks that's a good idea? Sounds good, right? We've got some students of business strategy, I can see, because they're nodding along. Like, yeah, makes sense. I find that in Michael Porter's textbook somewhere. It says, do exactly this. There's a tiny flaw with the strategy in reality, which is that every single thing I just said isn't true. But sounds good. Sounds good, by the way, are the two most dangerous words in entrepreneurship. Sounds good. Seems like it should work. Let me tell you a little anecdote that I found out the hard way. We shipped this product in about six months, took us to build it. And um, I guess I should, I should explain. Those of you who are engineers will know the saying, time, quality, money, pick two. People familiar with that? That's engineering speak for if you rush me, I'm going to produce a crappy product. And so we only had six months and not very much money. And we said, we are going to put this product out in the market, so help us God, we we're going to do it. And so we shipped a product after six months that was frankly terrible. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do any kind of sugarcoating of this. This is a product that would be more likely to crash your computer than it would be to give you a delightful 3D avatar experience. So I was very nervous. I was the chief technology officer after all. So what's my job? to make sure we put out high quality technology. So I wasn't exactly thrilled with the prospect of putting out something that would crash people's computer. I had this image in my mind, you know, some enterprising reporter would see our thing after we shipped it and they'd write an article, idiots at IMVU don't know what quality software means. And that would be the end of my career. I had this picture of like a mugshot, you know, in the engineer's hall of infamy. But we did it anyway. And at first I was actually relieved because nobody would even try the product. So at least nobody found out how bad it was, right? I was like, well, phew, dodged a bullet there. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what did I just spend the last six months of my life doing? And to make a long story short, we tried and tried and tried to get customers to download this product. And after running out of trying everything we could think of, we finally resorted to that absolute last resort, which is talking to customers. We said, all right, let's find out what's going on here. And I want you to just imagine this for a second. Here is a you know, young person excited about our new 3D avatar thing. We bring him into our office, have a focus group, and we would say, okay, customer, uh, try this new instant messaging add-on. And they would say, what is that? Like, it's an instant messaging add-on. It interoperates with all your thing. And they're like, what is that? I don't know what an instant messaging add-on is. That's not a category that means anything to me. Is it an IM client or not? And we'd be like, sort of, but it interoperates to avoid the network effects and the switching costs. And you got a picture like a 17 year old being like, what are you talking about? And basically like we've had this argument constantly. We'd be like, listen, we're paying you to be here in this usability test. So you will download this thing. And they'd be like, fine. <laughs> That's never a good sign to begin with. We'd force them to do it and they'd download it and they loved the 3D avatar and they loved customizing their avatar and they would check it out and be like, ooh, this is so fun. And then we would say, okay, time for the strategic brilliance. Time to invite one of your friends. They were like, no thanks, I decline. Why? I don't know if this thing is cool yet and so I'm not going to invite one of my friends to something that might be lame because then they're going to think I'm lame. And we're like, no, but it'll be so fun once you invite one of your friends, trust us. And then she's like looking at us, total deal breaker. And we tried that trick again, be like, no, we're paying you to be here, so you're going to do it. And I kid you not, most customers were like, I'll give you your money back. Because like in the definition of mission critical product for a teenager is right there in the dictionary, it says, do not make me look stupid in front of my friends. So those of you who work in enterprise software think only you have mission critical product, like so, au contraire. Our customers cared a lot about that. It was a complete deal breaker. We could not convince them to do this behavior. They kept saying, let me just try it myself first to see if it's cool and then I'll invite one of my friends. And we were from the video game industry and we knew exactly what that meant. It meant single player mode. 
So yes, we then proceeded to build single player mode version of a social communication product. It seemed like a really good idea at the time. See, here's the thing. We thought we should get a gold star bonus points because we were listening to customers. And aren't you supposed to listen to customers, right? Wrong. Here's what happened. Bring the customer in, pay them to download the damn thing again, <laughs> have them install the software. They love the avatar. We'd be like, okay, they would try it by themselves. They'd see all the cool things their avatar could do. And we would say, okay, now invite one of your friends. They'd be like, no thanks. Why not? This thing isn't cool. And we're like, but we told you it wasn't going to be cool. You made us build this feature and the whole thing. Because remember, we're like, well, you told us what to do and we did it. So shouldn't we, where's our gold star? But guess what? In entrepreneurship, there's no gold stars. You never get a, an award and you never get promoted. All you do is survive to face the next challenge. That's the highest praise you can get. Other, it's like survive or die. That's it. So to make this long story a little short, we had to pivot. And a pivot, just for those who are not familiar with the most overused buzzword of 2011, a pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. And it was pretty painful. And I want you to sympathize with me personally for a second, if you would. Guess who wrote the software that had to get thrown away as a result of the pivot? That, that would be me. I wrote thousands and thousands of lines of the most elegant, the best architected, the most well-factored, and just frankly beautiful software that has ever been written in all time. And I did it using all the latest product development techniques, agile, what they call extreme programming. So it was well factored and continuous integration and unit tests. For all the uh, people who understand what I'm talking about, we really did it to the T. And it still got thrown out. And I was pretty upset because agile development is supposed to help us el eliminate waste in product development. And here I was committing the biggest waste of all, building something that nobody wants. And I kind of felt like, gee, did I even have to be here the last six months? If all my work got thrown away, couldn't I have been on a beach somewhere, you know, have a vacation while my co-founders found out this horrible thing and then they bring me in later? And those of you who have been managers or entrepreneurs will know the excuse that I used to feel better, which was, well, no, I had to be there. It was important. People see where I'm going. If I hadn't been there, we wouldn't have learned this important thing, that namely what customers don't want and therefore executed this, excuse me, this pivot. Incidentally, managers who claim to have learned something are generally on the brink of being fired. So this is actually not that fun an excuse to use. Let me explain. If you're a general manager, some of you have worked in big companies will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you come to your boss and you're like, I have really good news. I learned something important about what customers don't want because I built this plan, I successfully executed it, and now I have missed all my targets. And, but the good news is, if you just give me another year and another million dollars, it's totally going to work this time. That, that usually is the last report you will ever give in your company because either, it means you didn't make a very good plan, in which case you should be fired. Or even worse, it means that you made a good plan and failed to execute it, in which case you should be like double fired, if that's even possible. Fired with extreme prejudice. <laughs> and yet in entrepreneurship, since we have this extreme uncertainty, we always fail. Our plans never turn out the way that they, uh, they're supposed to. So what do we do about that? I want us to rehabilitate the concept of learning. Because here's the, here's the way my thought process worked. It was like, wait a minute. Why am I using learning only now as an excuse to make myself feel better? How come the word learning didn't come up even one time during the past six months? What did my co-founders and I talk to each other about? You can guess. We talked about what features do we absolutely have to build and not build? What bugs do we have to fix? I mentioned before, what customers do we listen to and who do we ignore? The word learning never crossed our lips one time until we had to justify a failure. And I said, if our goal the last six months was to learn this important thing about customers. Why did it take six months? For example, we supported, I think, 12 different IM networks for interoperability out of the gate. Would our learning have been the same if we supported only six? Yeah. What if we supported only three? Yeah. What about only one network? We support only one client. Would we still have been able to learn that customers do not want to do this activity? Sure. Now, that's easy to say. You're like, oh, that's great. But wait a minute, that's 10 times less work for the same value. That was very upsetting. But that ain't nothing compared to this thought that was really disturbing. Because get this, what if we had just created a single web page with nothing more on it than a screenshot of the product we intended to build and a giant download button? Would we even have had to build page number two where we apologize that the product's not available yet? Or would a 404 have been sufficient what did I say before? I said they wouldn't download the product. That means they literally wouldn't click the button, so who cares what's on page two? 
Now you can see why this is disturbing to me because I had to pull out my business card and what does it say on my business card? Chief Technology Officer. It does not say Chief Crappy One Day Landing Page Experiment Officer. So then I was like, what am I supposed to do with my time? How is it possible that my six months of dedicated work could have the same value as a crappy one page you know, experiment that some designer could have whipped together in an hour? That was really disturbing and that is at the heart of what I'm trying to get at. That the value in an entrepreneurial situation is learning whether we're on the path to a sustainable business. Everything else that we do is waste. And that's really different than the 20th century management we're trying to uh, escape. Because fundamentally we have as a built in assumption in 20th century management that we can forecast what people will want and therefore we can build plans to anticipate what's going to happen and you get promoted if you beat plan. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Right? Beating the numbers is like the fetish of modern managers. And I was pretty surprised doing the research for the book. One of the things I learned that really surprised me was that uh, in the 1920s, the like, rudiments of today's modern multi-divisional company was worked out at places like General Motors and luminaries like Alfred Sloan. And at the heart of that technique of managing a multi-division company is something called accounting. I told you I was going to talk about accounting. I told you it was going to be really boring, so hang in there. Here's how accounting became the basis of modern management. Today we think of accounting as just the thing you do to keep track of where the money went, but that's not what it was for originally. At General Motors, they were able to predict with such accuracy how many cars they ought to sell in what they called an ideal year that they had a concept called the standard volume. How many cars, division by division, are we supposed to sell in a typical year? And they had the math and data analytics skills, remember in a pre-digital age, to do the math, to look at all the macroeconomic indicators of how the economy was doing right now and make predictions, how many cars should we sell quarter by quarter, division by division in the actual coming year? And so if you're a manager of a division in a recession and you sell less cars than you did last year, that's to be expected. But if you beat the plan, you can still be promoted. And similarly, if it's a boom year and you sell more cars than last year, you don't get to take credit for that. Does that sound familiar to anyone who's worked in a big company? That's the basis of modern management, this accounting. When I read that for the first time, I almost fell out of my chair. And here's why. I was like, wait a minute. You're telling me there was a time in history when people could forecast things and they came true? I've never seen that in my whole career. I thought plans and forecasts were a ritual that we went through, like a kabuki dance, to show to investors to be like, see, we can do this kabuki dance for some reason that I never totally understood. But I understood that you do not get funded without doing the dance. So I was like, okay, I'll do the dance. Any entrepreneur would be like, I'll jump through whatever hoops you want. I had no understanding of what they were for because I thought these, I'd never seen a plan come with an order of magnitude of reality. And yet there was a time when people could use those plans so effectively they could be used as the basis for promotions and who got fired. So, if you think about it, modern management has at its root a reliance on planning and forecasting, which means it only works when we have a long and stable operating history from which to extrapolate. Show of hands, who feels like the world is getting more and more stable every day? <laughs> Nobody, I can't believe it. Uh, it's just really shocking to me. I've never had one person raise their hand for that. What is happening is the world is moving from a world where most work happens in an environment that is amenable to general management to a world where more and more and more work every day is happening in an environment that requires a different management paradigm. One that requires its own accounting and management principles that are designed specifically for uh, the situation of high uncertainty. So even if you didn't sign up to become an entrepreneur, even if you on your business card it says, you know, general manager in super safe industry, it's time to suit up because disruption is coming. And for those of us who actually are entrepreneurs, we're pretty excited about it because your loss is our gain. The more uncertainty, the more chaos, the more disruption, the better for us. So we're pretty psyched. In the book, I lay out something called innovation accounting, which is an alternate accounting method for trying to figure out whether we're making progress in situations of high uncertainty. And I'm just going to close with a little flavor of it. To get the details, obviously, you'll have to buy the book, or I see many of you actually already have it, so thank you. Uh, but what are you going to do with only one copy? How are you going to loan it out to other people? That seems like a, probably an oversight. I'm sure somebody here will sell you more copies. I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, yeah, okay. If I'm the CFO of a major company and I fund some entrepreneur and they come back to me a year later and they give me that report that says, just give me one more year. I know I promised you the sun, the moon, and the stars when you gave me this money, but trust me, we learned all this important stuff and we just need one more year to be fine. 
we like to heap scorn on those CFOs for firing those managers. Like they're so conservative and they don't believe in innovation. It's all their fault. And it is all their fault, that's true. But I'm sympathetic because our current system of accounting cannot, fundamentally cannot tell the difference between a team that spent a year learning really valuable lessons and a team that spent the year goofing off. Because both of them will have a pathetically small number of customers. Both of them will have minimal revenue. They will be doing terrible on what I call the vanity metrics that are the underpinnings of modern accounting. So think about what a breakdown in the paradigm that is. We literally, it's not like we're talking about the difference between a slightly high performing team and a slightly less, no. We can't tell the difference between team on the brink of a major breakthrough and team that has accomplished absolutely nothing and wasted their time. That is a fundamental breakdown. So what we need to do is say, let's stop looking at the vanity metrics. Let's stop looking at the gross numbers. Let's actually look at the inputs to the spreadsheet to see which teams are actually being successful in running experiments that change customer behavior for the better. And by doing so, we can put the concept of product market fit on a more rigorous footing, a quantitative footing. So we can say, this team is getting closer to product market fit and this one isn't. That is fundamentally our goal. And when we make that transition, I fundamentally believe we will make the process of innovation more scientific, more likely to succeed, and just frankly, a lot more fun. So I really want to get to some q and I really want to ask some questions, so I'll, I'll stop here and just say thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. So we have two mics in the audience. If you could raise your hand to tell us who you are, and we'll bring the mic to you. OK, if I sit. Hi, my name is Max from Big Bang Technology, and I'm here with uh, a big old crew of the Lean Coffee TO group. So hey, shout congratulations. Outs. Thank you for coming. What can we do to help each other more uh, in our community of startups in Toronto? Oh, thank you for that question. I, first of all, you got to understand, when I talk to the media, you know, I'm on a book tour, so I'm on TV and doing all this crazy stuff, and people always ask me, how do you know that the Lean startup is, is working, that it's a good idea? And one of my things I vowed to myself when I became a professional expert was that I would do my best to only say things that are actually true, not just things that sound good. Even though as a professional expert, people only care if what you're saying sounds good. No, not one person has asked me, is it actually true? No one cares. But I care. And to me, the number one indicator that this is something real and not just you know, a flight of fancy is the fact that so many entrepreneurs in so many cities around the world are doing what you're doing, which is coming together on a regular basis to explore how to use these ideas and put them into practice. And it is in those local communities that the real work of pushing the envelope is happening. My job is a very strange job. My job is to make people like you famous. What I have to do is tell the world, here's a breakthrough that we have made. Here's something we have figured out about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and the only people who are actually finding that out, it's not me, I'm doing this. The people who are finding it out are the entrepreneurs who are putting these ideas into practice every day. So I think the most important thing you can do as a community is to come together on a regular basis and hold each other accountable for making real progress. And it's hard. Sharing what's really going on with your startup is probably the most um, counterintuitive and painful thing any founder is asked to do. Because we all, we all intuitively understand that what you're supposed to be doing is telling everybody how great it's going. Right? Everything is always up and to the right. I never talk to an entrepreneur who's doing badly. Everything is just is roses. And there's a real reason we do that. It's not just because we're pathological liars. It's also, because, it's also because we know if we admit that we don't know where we're going, then people will have loss of confidence and that can cause loss of morale. It's the same reason we try to keep our products hidden and not put them out in the world because there's this thing called the audacity of zero. Having no results inspires confidence, ironically, that big results might come, but having small results inspires questions about why haven't those big results shown up already. So what we need to do is create safe spaces where entrepreneurs can share with each other what really is really going on and then be held accountable for having that same story the next time. So that's what I would be focused on, is um, ask each other, what are the metrics that really matter for your business, and where are they going to be a month from now? And then report back a month later, hey, I know you tell your investors you got this new, more important metric that's all up and to the right, thanks to Eric's law of Google Analytics. At all times, no matter how badly you're screwing up, at least one graph in Google Analytics is up and to the right. So you could always find something that's up and to the right, no problem. That's the problem with shipping it and seeing what happens, incidentally. You are guaranteed to succeed at seeing what happens. Something is guaranteed to happen, so you can always find something to be excited about, but only a true friend, 
Only a fellow entrepreneur who understands what you're doing will be able to call you on that BS and say your investors might fall for that, but you said customer engagement was the number one and most important thing. You've been working on this product for a month and your customer engagement is exactly the same as it was last month. So by what, in what world can you say that you've made progress on this product? I challenge you to say everything you did the last month was a complete waste of time. Your investors are never going to say that to you. Your spouses are never going to say that to you. You're just, like, what you need is someone who can call you on that. I think that is the single most important thing. So thank you very much for doing that. It really means a lot to me. Okay, we have a question at the back and then one here. John? Pivot to a different microphone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, could Lean Startup have saved Manhattan uh, in Ghostbusters? I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is, um, do I believe that Lean Startup is the be-all, end-all of managing innovation, or what about things like Blue Ocean Strategy? If Ghostbusters had done customer development, by which I think the questioner means if they had asked customers what they want, they would not have gotten anywhere because, of course, there was no need for them you know, before Zool shows up, and therefore, you know, wouldn't Lean Startup have destroyed Manhattan? Which that's pretty cool. I, that's a powerful concept if you could destroy Manhattan. So thank you. I think that as a compliment. Um, and, and I appreciate the question, actually, not just because it has a Ghostbusters reference, which warms my heart, but because there's a really deep and important question, which is, well, what is the role of strategy? See, I've, avoid, I've tried to avoid the entire time I've been speaking saying one word about strategy. What's a good strategy versus what's a bad strategy? How do you model your strategy? How do you put it on a canvas or all these other, you know, do you have a blue ocean strategy or this kind of... And there's a reason I'm, talk, I'm not talking about it. And it's not because it's not important. It's actually critically important. It's just the only topic that I think is actually well covered in general management theory for entrepreneurs. It's so well covered, there's a million excellent books on strategy. And the reason I don't bother with it is that I have not even one time in my whole career of talking to startups, and I've talked to hundreds, probably thousands at this point, trying to help them, I have never been able to talk an entrepreneur out of their idea or their plan on the basis of it's not a good strategy. I've tried everything, and I've had people pitch me the dumbest plans I've ever seen in my life. The problem is I've also had people pitch me things like Facebook, which I also thought was the dumbest thing I ever heard of in my life, and turned out to be a pretty good idea. Here's the problem. Startups don't fail because their strategy is incoherent. They fail because their strategy is based on wrong facts. And so my goal is to help startups figure that out as quickly as possible. And those of you who have studied business strategy have an advantage. The goal of strategy in a startup is not to give you answers, it's to help you figure out what are the questions you need to ask. So by doing things like analogs and antilogs, looking at what other business patterns are, business models, business model canvas, all that stuff is useful if you're confused about, for example, what kind of channel distribution is going to be useful for you, whether you should pursue a blue ocean strategy or try to go face off against competitors and what the issues are. That, that stuff's still important. But the questioner snuck a second question in. Well, this is actually just a red herring. So strategy, important, but well covered. The other question is, but what about the fact that in a blue ocean strategy, customers can't tell you what they want? And I think that's so true, I want to just repeat it a couple times. Customers do not know what they want. It is a fact. We are psychologically unable to answer, as human beings, hypothetical questions about well, how we would behave in the future. It's one of the things we just can't do. Like, not even, how will you feel about lunch tomorrow? Forget, do you think you would want to pay for this hypothetical product that I'm kind of vaguely describing to you and that may or may not exist in the future? It's garbage in, garbage out. People have no idea. But imagine I was a physicist, and I'm working on the structure of the atom, and I come up here and say, my job is impossible because electrons don't know what they want. I can't ask them what they're going to do, so I give up. You'd laugh. Like, that's absurd. Your job is not to ask electrons what they're going to do. Your job is to run experiments that reveal the behavior of electrons or whatever else your subject is so that you can learn whether your hypothesis, your vision, is true or untrue. And so that's the, the essence of the book is you know, trying to get people to see their interactions with customers not as asking what they want. Remember how badly that turned out for us at InView, right? Remember single player mode? Absurd. It's to run experiments that reveal what customer behavior is. And that, I think, is what we're trying to do with, uh, with Lean Startup. 
Uh, it's Mark Elwood. I've been an entrepreneur for 23 years, and I think I represent some of the folks here. So I'm developing a line extension product, a web-based product. I think we can launch for about $30,000. The question, though, is, well, are we going to be able to handle growth? Everyone's concerned about growth. Yeah. You hear about startups with first phase financing and second phase. They just got a million dollars, two million. Can you do it for a small amount of money and grow, or is there a risk in not being ready for the growth that we all hope will come? Thank you, I love that question. First of all, I wanna be super clear, lean startup does not mean cheap startup, so I'm not trying to get you to raise more or less money. How much money you raise is really an orthogonal question to this, it has to do with your strategy and what you're trying to accomplish. Some businesses, to build the minimum viable product, you need millions of dollars, and some you need hundreds of dollars, and I'm, I couldn't possibly tell you which, which you are. Lean startup is about using capital more efficiently by not wasting it building the wrong things. But although we focus a lot on the very beginning phase, things like how do you pick the minimum viable product, how do you get that early signal, if you read the book, uh, almost a third of the book is concerned not with that question, but the question of how do we scale given that we're doing things in this just-in-time fashion. It's a concept I call just-in-time scalability. Because I'm cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of high-profile companies that have failed because they couldn't keep up with demand. And we like to joke, well, isn't that, wouldn't that be a nice problem to have? But if you're the CTO of a company like I was, it's not a nice problem to have. When the company fails because the technology doesn't scale, not only does it fail, not only do you lose all your money, but guess whose fault it is? It's one identifiable person's fault, namely yours, the worst kind of failure in the world. So I was very worried about that, especially at InView, because we are practicing these highly iterative development techniques, including one called continuous deployment, where we're putting software into production you know, 50 times a day on average. So when I talk about rapid iteration, I am not kidding around. Don't come to me and tell me, oh, we ship once a week and we're so proud of it. Pathetic. 50 times a day on average. And people told me, for every size X that InView was, that sure, that'll work at size X, but it'll never work at size 2X. I keep hearing that. People still say that to me. It's like, sure, it'll work for five people, but never for 10. Sure, it'll work for 10, but not for 20. Or you have five million customers, it'll work, but never when you have 10 million. Because people can't understand this technique because it, it so flies in the face of our conventional thinking about anticipating problems and preventing them. I call it the curse of prevention. And here's the problem. Let's say that I was to convince you, just I would say I was a very charismatic speaker, and I convinced you that an asteroid was about to hit our building and kill us all. And you were really worried about it. And then I said, but there's a fix. All we have to do is run upstairs onto the roof and cover this uh, uh, skylight here with tinfoil. And with a nice tinfoil, that will reflect the cosmic rays and cause the asteroid not to, not to hit us. And let's say that you believe me, and we all ran up there, and we did that, and we're like, phew, OK. And I was like, OK. The asteroid would have hit us in 10, you know, 3, 2, 1. We did it. Congratulations. It didn't hit us. Now, that's pretty stupid, right? You'd be like, wait a minute. How do we even know that an asteroid would have hit us? But in engineering, and in fact, in most functional disciplines, we promote people for their good job at anticipating and preventing problems if, the pro if they do an intervention and then the problem doesn't happen. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And scalability is the worst at this. If you want to kill somebody's project, those of you who've worked in big companies know exactly this technique. You can do uh, death by corner case. Really useful political strategy, you might want to try this. All you have to do is during the product planning meeting for that project, just be like, great, uh, what would happen if, and just start making stuff up. What happens if five million customers all use the product at the exact same time? Have you thought of that? Oh no, shoot, better. Well, what if they all use it exactly one minute apart? What if everyone comes from Singapore? Have you thought about that? What about, you just, you could do that all day, and any product manager you do that to is so screwed. Because what are they going to do? Either they can be like, that's never going to happen, in which case, what if it does happen? Fired. Or they can be like, well, we'll take that into account and plus up the project a little bit, and now you can feel the scope creep happening. And then, you know, scope creep just makes you think a giant bullseye for the cutting. You understand how this works, right? So startups have this problem to the max, because scalability is always on everybody's mind, and yet when you have five customers, like, you don't have any scalability problems. And the answer is to say, let us not invest in prevention, but rather in fast response. So we, whenever we have a choice, when we identify a possible problem, we could invest in preventing that problem, or we could invest in generic process improvements that improve our agility, so that if that problem comes to pass, we can respond to it quickly. And in the book, I lay out the case, the economic case, for why it is always better to make those process improvements than prevention improvements. And just so you understand what I'm saying, so that you know, when you say this to one of your engineers, their head doesn't explode, or after it does, you can deal with the aftermath. I'm specifically saying we will identify things that might go wrong, potentially fatal scalability problems, and then we will intentionally not fix them. Okay? If you can do that, then you're on the path 
to this kind of scalability. Now, we call it just-in-time scalability because what's going to happen is we will be able to adjust so quickly to what's really happening, we can constantly and systematically refactor our system so that it can scale. And this is true of our technical systems, but also our human organizational systems. I advocate something I call adaptive management so that we can get the right level of process even as we scale so that bureaucracy is not our inevitable destination. Now, I wish I could teach you all of these techniques while I'm here on stage, but the whole point I had to write a book is that each of those is a whole chapter unto itself. And you know, I hope that you'll have a chance to read it and then email me and tell me what you think. But I fundamentally believe that is the path to scalability. Okay, we have time for one more question. Anyone? Oh, up here at the front. Hi, my name is Ivan Francis. Um, is there a trade-off between IP protection and kind of this design of experiments that you're talking about? So if I just take my market and throw it, take my product and throw it into the marketplace before I've done all this development, then really I might not have any IP protection. So talk about what that trade-off might be if it really does exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I am not a lawyer and you should seek legal counsel before you do, do anything. Okay? I'm not giving you legal advice, but there's a very few kinds of startups where a really revolutionary scientific breakthrough is at the heart of the startup and that selling the patent to that technology, that breakthrough is going to be important to the startup's life in some way. Um, it is a very rare thing these days. If you're in any kind of software business, forget it. I can't tell, think of the last time I saw a legitimately patentable software idea. And the reason uh, we have this fear about IP protection is that in some jurisdictions, and I actually I don't know anything about Canadian law, but in some jurisdictions, uh, if you the, the kind of the clock starts for filing your patent protection the day you release the product to anybody versus when you publish it to the general public. And I think that's just a terrible public policy choice that, you know, we talk about how can public policymakers influence innovation, reforming the patent system is one of the really important things that needs to happen. Unfortunately, in the States, we just made it worse, so for God's sake. But at the root of this fear is a fear that, you know, someone will copy your idea. That's really what this is about. Patent protection is supposed to help you uh, prevent that from happening. But I have a better way to protect your idea from being stolen by a big company. And that is to do nothing because big companies can't steal your idea because they're incompetent. See, that's the whole reason to start companies in the first place. And so here I have a, I have a, a solution, I have a, a cure-all. Anyone who has the fear of having their idea stolen, I have an exercise that has cured 100% uh, of people afflicted with this that I've ever tried it on. If you do this exercise, I promise you will no longer have this fear. And here it is. Every entrepreneur has a list of ideas, you know, all your amazing ideas, one through a million. And right now you're working on idea number one, but you always know you got idea number two ready. So just pick one of your second tier ideas. It can be number two, number five, doesn't matter. Second tier idea, but still a good one, one you believe in. And try to have it stolen. <laughs> Write a memo, send a telegram, go to some, find the relevant product manager at the relevant big company, and you explain to them why this idea is one worth stealing and see if they steal it. Because guess what? The relevant product manager has already thought of it. They have a million good ideas. The whole point is they can't execute them faster than you can. If they could, you're so screwed. <laughs> Think about it. If you can't get through that build, measure, learn feedback loop faster than a giant company, what does that say about you? I mean, well, that's a serious, serious problem. And no head start from stealth mode is going to help you. You still want to file patents, I know. And go ahead. I mean, I, we had an IP attorney at MPU very early who, who, in exchange for equity, helped us file a bunch of patents. I'm, I hold a ton of software patents. Uh, like all business processes and software patents, I think they're completely bogus. But, you know, it was helpful in filing. So, like, there's nothing wrong with filing patents. But I, I don't know any case of an early stage technology company, again, except in the very limited case of breakthrough science, where patents actually made a significant difference one way or the other. So, I would never trade agility for IP protection. Never. Uh, and then for those who actually have that problem, there are techniques you can use, a good lawyer can help you design how to do the rapid experimentation without violating any IP protection issues. I'll just mention one last story, just to leave you with a, a feel-good story. Uh, when we raised our first venture capital round at InView, um, we were approached by a large company that run, big media company that runs a big website that you've all heard of. And they said, we'd like to buy your company. Don't take venture capital. We'd be much better off buying. And we were like, oh, we're not sure. We think we want to take venture capital. And they said, listen, to sweeten the deal, we'll make you this offer. If you don't get bought by us, we will build a direct competitor with you and kill you. And we were like, uh, OK. 
really? And they're like, yes, we're totally serious. We will destroy you. So it's like, take this offer or die. It says something about our state of mind that we said, okay, fine, we'll die. We choose, we choose death. <laughs> and so we decided to take the venture capital. Six months later, one of my co-founders is now working at big company X, working on a competitive product with $100 million of funding at its disposal. So they know everything about us, our business plan, every mistake we've made, everything we've done up to that point, because they got one of our co-founders on staff. Two years later, Big Company X releases their competitive product. And what's hilarious is that their product is an exact clone of the product we had released two years ago. We thought that product was horrible. We iterated thousands of times since there. We had pivoted many times. We were on a completely different model at that time. They launched the product. It didn't yield in, you know, immediate traction. And because they put the big company brand on it, that became embarrassing to senior management. Six weeks later, or 12, I can't remember how long it took, that product's not available in the market anymore. That whole division gets shut down. And this big company writes off a $100 million loss. So how valuable was the idea, really? Right? They stole it from us, copied it verbatim. But guess what? If you can out-iterate, you will win. And if you can't out-iterate, secrecy will not help you. So don't do drugs. Don't do stealth mode. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, I know we could keep going. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Robin has it. Well, unfortunately, Rob, Robin has a reputation of starting and ending on time. And then, unfortunately, Eric has a car waiting to take him to the airport tonight. So um, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, all the books have been pre-signed, I think. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure to have you here at Rotman. I think everybody really enjoyed this. Going to hear this for a long, remember it for a long time. Uh, let's uh, show Eric how much we appreciate his visit.